because I'm a middle class boy from Denmark, right? I mean, uh, mm-hmm. and I didn't really realize that they, uh, that there was that the sky was the limit. I I mean, if anyone tells you that they knew when they were 15 years old that they were going to do this and this and this, and then 50 years later they are so and so, I don't believe them. For me, it was a, it was a, just about applying myself to the best of my ability in everything I did, right? For someone who comes from a middle class family in Denmark whose only aim was to become a sailor and go to sea because he loved that. Today being CEO of Anglo Eastern Shipping Company, such a huge shipping company, it must have been beyond dreams, beyond imagination. An inspiring journey, I would say. There are a lot of questions asked in this video, which really will help us all believe in ourselves. It will help us all dream big and it might help us all to achieve big as well. So what are we waiting? Let's just watch this video. Dream big. Let us achieve big. Let us get inspired. So my first question to you is, when you started your journey, did you ever think you will become one day become CEO of Anglison Shipping Company? No, never. No. Never. No, I, 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 uh, listen, <laughs> I was just a young man. Um, I was 18 years of age and uh, I wanted to go to sea. I wanted to I wanted to sail and uh, see the world. Um, I always been very fond of, of the sea and of water. You know, I always loved swimming and uh, boating, and uh, you know, I was doing a lot of windsurfing when I was a kid and stuff like that. Uh, it was always on the on the water, and I just knew I wanted to work with the sea and to go sailing. And the rest, I had no idea about. I really had no idea. So, uh, so my second question. So you started your journey with Danish Navy. Then you became a sailor, second officer, third officer. Then you did a shore job. Then you again became a chief officer. Then you became a marine superintendent. Then a manager. Then a captain. It has been like you started with sea. You started with defense. You went as a sailor. Then again a shore job. Then you sailed for some time. Then you went shifted to shore job again. Then again you sailed as a chief officer. Then again you shifted back to shore. Then a captain. Then MD of Mars, then MD of Thome, then C of Univan, C of Anglison. So my question is, sir, when I started my career, my aim was, okay, I have to become a chief engineer in Merchant Navy. And I followed that path. But when I look at your career, it has been a mix of both from the very beginning of your career. Yeah. Why has it been so? Um, I, I, I think, uh, listen, I just knew that whatever I did... I just wanted to do a really good job, right? I mean, I, I knew that applying myself and and doing the best I could at any job, whether that was a third officer or a second officer or, or whatever I was doing, was my that was my objective. And and I didn't think very much about where that would lead me. Um, and of course, Maersk, where I was sailing, was a big company, right? So they have a lot of opportunities for people to try out different things. Uh, so I had this chance to do a storage coordination job, uh, uh, you know, between my second, my second officer and chief officer jobs. Uh, I was a storage coordinator for for a couple of years, where I think the last year I actually spent more on project stuff, more about developing uh, IT solutions for storage coordinations, stuff like that. And then I went back to CD to become a chief in, chief officer. At that time, I had the ambition to continue to uh, to become a captain. But then someone called me and said, "Would you like to come and work as a marine superintendent for a while?" And I said, "Yes, I would love to do that. That that sounds like a great challenge, and I can learn something." And so, every everywhere in that journey, I haven't really given it a lot of thought about um, where did it end up and how do I get there. I was always just focused on today and on doing uh, the best I could in the job that I had. Now, obviously, um, when I then, you know, uh, had sailed a couple of ships as a captain and had come ashore with Maersk in uh, in Singapore and then Maersk sent me to Hong Kong. And in 2006, I was, uh, I remember I was thinking, now I've been with Maersk for 13 years and you know, they, it's obviously a good company, it's a big company, and I have I have a good job. I was a managing director of a repair and reconditioning workshop for Merck here in, here in Hong Kong, and uh, 
and in China that was a, you know it was an exciting job but I just thought maybe I should try something else um, so in, um, in in 2007 I started looking for uh, opportunities outside of Maersk I did not know that I was going to work in sea management at that time I, I knew that I loved working with ships and with people on board ships I mean that was in my you know I, I just love yeah, whenever I see a ship I get excited right um, but to be honest, um, I was applying for a job to run a, a shoe factory in uh, China. I mean, basically, there was a Danish uh, company called Echo okay. who, were, who were producing uh, shoes in China and they needed a, a you know, production uh, manager. And I thought that sounds like something I could I could do. And I applied for that. I didn't get it. Um, I also was, uh, there was a headhunter who knocked on my door and said, how about selling, you know, container terminal software in Asia? You can become the Asia Pacific uh, uh, sales manager uh, for Asia uh, for a company called Navis, which is Oakland, US, California based, right? It's one of the biggest, uh, you know, uh, producers of, contain of, of uh, software to container terminals in the world. And I... I was in the run for that job. I didn't get it. Um, and then uh, at some point, someone called me and said, "Why? Why don't you come to become a ship, you know, ship managing, ship manager or managing director in Toma in Singapore?" And there, I had a few talks with the, you know, the family behind that company, and uh, we agreed that I would do that. And I absolutely loved it. I mean, for me, ship management was exactly what I wanted, you know, what I wanted to do. Of course, I knew about ship management inside of Maersk, but I didn't know about you know, so-called third party management, right? But and I, I and I loved it. I think it's it's, it's an exciting business. I love to work with people in ship management. I love ships, right? So um, I, I yeah. So I just grabbed that as an opportunity. And um, after four years there, I, I got another knock on the door, and someone said, you know, Captain Vanderpeer passed away a couple of years ago. Would you like to go and run Univand? And that's. You know, that's why I, I, I joined Univan and then of course we you know Univan and and released and merged in two thousand fifteen because Peter Kramers and I we met and uh, we decided that we should do something together and um, and then after a few a few months of discussion we we, yeah, we agreed to do the merger right? so so it's just been sort of step by step. Um Great. I, I you know, you never know where people are, where this journey leads you. I mean, if anyone tells you that they knew when they were 15 years old that they were going to do this and this and this, and then 50 years later they are so and so, I don't believe them. For me, it was a, it was a, just about applying myself to the best of my ability in everything I did. Right? And and okay, yeah. So my next question is: See, uh, it is not with you, but 99% of the people they do not know, but it goes. So how much do you give it to luck? For the success that you have had and when it comes to work ethics what are two to three things which you would recommend each and every one of us out here who are budding chief engineers captains or sailors chief officers ki we need to really focus on that so that we also become uh, someone like you or aspire to become someone like you mm. a, a lot plays a very big part of it that's no doubt about that you have, i mean but but i think more than luck or or you can say the kind of luck you need is for other people uh, to want to give you a chance. Right? I mean, I, I think one of the, some of the more important uh, luck in my life was uh, in Maersk, there was this guy, this vice president in, in, uh, in ship management in Maersk, who took a liking to me when I was a young superintendent right? and said, you can make it far in this company. He said, I'm, you know, I'm going to push you to become... You know, to run our, our Singapore office uh, a few years later. Uh, so meeting someone like that was was very fortuitous. Um, you know, later on in life, I met uh, Richard Hext. He was he was uh, uh, he used to be a CEO of Pacific Basin. He is on the board of Swire Shipping, and uh, he was also the chairman of Univan. And and he was like, he says, you should come here and work for us because uh, I believe in you. He says. So I think. That kind of luck, where you have other people, um, you know, put put some uh, some faith in you and push you forward. That's that's the most important luck you can have. And of course, some of that luck is self created, right? Because you have to create that impression with people that you have that they believe in you, right? Uh, but 
it doesn't happen without a, an element of sheer, you know, blind luck. You have to meet people. And then you say, how do you do that? Well, you, you stay open to opportunities, I guess. That's, that's the... Uh, Great. Right. So my next question to you is, sir, what, uh, 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 what was the turning point in your life? Was it Musk's maestro program or was it executive leadership program at Sanford? Or, uh, or no, no, something I else. Think, I think um, it, was, it was the maestro program more than anything. And, and, uh, and I think that the, the, ch the change came... Because, you know, again, I think the, the Maestro program taught me um, that actually, you know, you can become anything you want. I, I didn't really understand that because I'm a middle class boy from Denmark, right? I mean, uh, and I didn't really realize that, they, uh, that, that, was, that the sky was the limit. I, you know, I, know, I knew I was uh, smart enough and I could make, you know, maybe a, maybe a manager somewhere in a company, right? Or, or a captain. That was an aspiration I had, right? But I never really thought that that could lead to much more than that. And I think the Maestro program was the sort of uh, the sort of moment or, or those years. I was I was in my late twenties, and I think um, it was very formative for me in terms of my opening my mind to the possibilities of uh, of, of you know, and anything is possible. I think that was a that was a moment. So when it comes when it comes to work ethics, which are two to three qualities which you really feel are very important to become. Uh, someone big in life. Love plays an important role, but work ethics is really, really important. Yeah, I, so I'm old school, right? So, so uh, working hard, I think, is a. I mean, I always tell my children, you know, yeah, there will be many, many kids in school. Uh, they are growing up now, right? But there will be many kids at school, at your workplace, many young people who are as talented as you are, who uh, who are have studied as hard as you as you have, who has learned as much. But one thing you can always differentiate yourself by is by working harder than anyone. Because you can always put in 5% more effort. Right? You can always make sure you're switched on. I mean, that, that's one thing you can do. So it's always been one of my sort of mentors in life. What you don't have in your head, maybe make sure you have in your in your stamina, right? I mean, make sure you work harder. Wow. So I always put in an amazing amount of time and, and effort. Um, but the second, the other thing I would say is integrity. Um, is super important along the way uh, because integrity and trust go hand in hand and you can't do anything in life unless you have the trust of other people right and uh, you you earn that trust by being a man of integrity so and that goes back to maybe the, the next part which is about authenticity uh, you know I think um, you know I, I've done a few management courses here and there I've done the Stanford thing right and they teach you that strategy is like this, that organization uh, works like this, or this is good, good leadership. But it's not always like that. I think you have to dig into yourself and, and be your authentic self along the way. I mean, the reality is that people are successful for wildly different reasons. We cannot all be taken out of a, of a, of a template or a boilerplate and say, that's the, the model leadership. No, we have to be true to our, our, our own way of being and our own heart and our own passions and go with that. Right? So authenticity, I think, is really important as well. Very well said, sir, because recently the course that I'm doing, they say authenticity means I say is equal to I do. So an example is, sir, each time my uh, son comes to me and he says, Papa, I want to play with you. I tell him, okay, I'll play at 8 o'clock. He comes at 8 o'clock. I tell him, okay, 8.30, I'm busy right now. I don't do, I don't play with him. So, when I'm not doing it with my son, tomorrow when he becomes 14 years old, he'll not follow what I'll tell him. Because he knows what Papa says, he does not do that. So, it starts from here and then yeah. from it from here, it goes to what you say and then it goes to the people you're working with. So, that is how it creates. Am I right, sir? Yeah, absolutely right. <laughs> and, and in a way, what you're saying is, if you think the right stuff, if, if, you, know, if you make sure that what is in your head is is um, you know honorable it's upright it's uh, it's full of integrity then what comes out of your mouth will be a, a, a piece of what you think right and what you do it will be what you say and so on and so forth right? so if you can think correct say what you think do what you say then I think you come a long way in terms of, uh, of, of being a person of integrity and with that you earn you earn other people's trust right? I mean so it's, it's a, it starts with your head, right? It starts with your mind, and, um, and and you're absolutely right. You know, make sure you do the right thing because you think the right thing. 
Thank you, sir. Sir, my next question to you is: This is really important. Sir, you are handling a big, big, big organization today. How do you control or how do you handle discontentment among the team when you are doing the best from your end? Because it is really very, very, but it's impossible to keep everybody happy. So, how do you handle this discontent, discontentment among the team? I think, with honesty, I mean, you, you, you. Uh you have to be honest about what what creates uh, what we are, and you know how how what we do is a trade off between resources and desires, and you know everyone wants to get promoted, but not everyone can be, and you got to be honest about why you choose one over another, and these kind of things. Uh, so I think honesty is a very important part. Then, so my next question: is, How do you, sir, being a CEO, how do you manage your time, like? Uh, when I was in school in India, we were never taught importance of time management. And when I was on ship, I was always focused on my work. Family life stayed separate. Today, when I'm on land, I'm a mix of I have to work, I have to take care of my family, I have to go do this, do that. And sir, I'm in a big mess. So, how do you manage your time? Yeah, and especially as a manager, you you actually never have time uh, to do everything you would like to do. So, so you have to prioritize, right? So one of my one of my um, tricks or recipes for myself is when I wake up in the morning and I think about all the things I have to do today and uh, I look at my calendar and I, I you know I always I always look for the the one thing that I dislike the most. So the the one thing that I can see of all the things I must be, I must do that I don't like to do that tends to be the most important thing, right? And, uh, and then I go, uh, go uh, do that first. I mean, so, you know, we, there, we all have, you know, propensities to say, oh, let me do this because it's nice, I like to do this. So let me do this, I'm good at this. And then we leave the, the stuff we are not so good at and perhaps that uh, we, think, we think are painful or difficult, we leave them aside. But I think one of the, one of the, one of the you know, ways to become successful is no, you go the other way. You always pick the most difficult one first, and you deal with that. And uh, because once it's done, uh, you you, re you realize you solve something that was difficult, and, and one of the big things in, in in your life or in your work, and you feel so much lighter. Also, you suddenly have more energy to, to attack the next thing. So I think that you know forcing yourself to go after the difficult uh, and unpleasant jobs is perhaps. Uh, a tool that I use. Okay. So this is very similar to a book that I read by Brian Tracy, Eat That Frog. So he says this thing, ki, it, it's like eating a frog is one of the most disgusting thing that you can do. And if you have to do it early in the morning, it is really, really pathetic. You can feel that. So it is the most important to do that first. So something very similar to that. Absolutely. Yes. That, that's correct. Yes. And, and sometimes you often find that it's stuff that you don't like to do. But, but then pick that. Me. I'll try to follow this sir if I really have to do something big in life. So books that you would recommend me or you would recommend your children anytime? I would say the first one would be uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Uh, I have it. By Stephen Covey. Yes, I have yeah, it. I think, I think that's one of the sort of, uh, for me, that's one of the, uh, the, 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 the Bibles of, um, of how I, how I what, what, what teaches me to think properly, right? Those seven principles are really, really good. Um, and then there's a book called Of Blood and Hope by Samuel Pizar. So for me, it's a story about how uh, you can be the most destroyed uh, and crumbled person in the world, but given the right circumstances, you can also do the ma most amazing things in your life, right? I mean, he, 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 turned, he turned his life around, and I think that's super inspiring and, and uh, something that I often think about. So it's one of the books that made a big, big uh, impact on me. Extreme Ownership, that's a good book. Which one, sir? Extreme Ownership. Extreme Ownership. Um, but it's about how US Navy SEALs lead and win. I think that's a very good book. It's very sort of practical advice about uh, leading from the front, owning the outcome of your life, uh, basically. So, so Extreme Ownership, that's a good book. Obliquity. Obliquity. It's yeah. a book about how sometimes the best way to get things done is uh, is doing them indirectly. Obliquity. Then, you sir, should look that one up. 
And then, of course, the one that's called uh, Mindset uh, by Carol Dweck. It's about if you, if you can if you can imagine it, it can happen, right? But you got you got to somehow get to a place where that is more than just a, a theory. You actually believe it, right? It, it's it's that kind of uh, thing. Right? Thank so, thank you, sir. It really means a lot. In India, it is Namaste. Thank you very much, Jai Mata Di. And sir, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you very much. Very, very good questions, uh, Parid. I, I, I enjoyed this as well, so thank you. Uh, you. You gave me something to think about as well. So that's very much appreciated. Sir, thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Jamal. And good luck with it, okay? Thank you, sir. Good luck. Thank you, sir. Right. Thank Take you. care. Take care, sir. Bye, sir. Bye.